So welcome to this episode of Health and Wealth. I'm here today with Søren Lemonius, who is the founder and managing partner of Sunstone Life Size Ventures, a Danish venture capital firm. Welcome, Søren. Thank you very much. So I was thinking last night, I was actually standing in the kitchen preparing a pizza dough because okay. uh, that's a that's a that's a typical friday tradition in my family we right. always do pizza on fridays right. and since maybe five years i've had this you know small pizza oven gas driven yeah. and it makes quite good pizzas okay so but while i was standing there kneading the dough i was thinking uh what should i ask um uh, uh, what should i ask sir when he comes here and um I guess the first thing I could ask is, do you have any specific Friday traditions? Uh, do I? Well, not really, I think. Not really. No. Taking it as you go, more yeah. or less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't, I don't really think so. I, and you know, partic- I think, so I have, I have adult sons, right, that moved away from home. So now it's me and my wife. I think back when they were living at home, yes, because life needed to run on a routine. Uh, it doesn't anymore, right? I would say what we have managed to do, but this is, I think we've become quite good at me and my wife that basically saying, you know, let's meet inside Copenhagen, mm-hmm. have a cocktail, uh, let's enjoy the liberty we won. What is it now? Six, five, six years ago. I think we do that, but but taking it to a routine Friday routine, uh, that would probably be, be a stretch. I think that sounds like a perfect framework for a, for a, a good start of the weekend. I mean, I uh, love, usually love is. Copenhagen. It, it usually is, right? And as with spring coming now, I mean, that, that also sort of put Copenhagen's in its best light possible. And then meeting in there Friday, sunny afternoon for a cocktail, that's almost as good as it gets. Yeah, uh, that's a perfect ending of the week for sure. So... Um, Tell me a little bit about Sunstone Life Science Ventures. Uh, yeah. What kind of fun or what kind of firm is it? What kind right. of funds do you have? And uh, how did it all start? Oh, those were many questions in one, right? So, so, so let's. So, Sunstone Life Science Ventures, as the name implies, I mean that actually that actually points to where back to where to where it started. Um, with a with a venture fund uh, that was born out of the venture groups at what used to be Vext Fund and today is IFO, which is to some extent comparable to Industry Fund. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a government. It's uh, a governmentally yeah. owned organization set up to support I would say any type of entrepreneurship, ranging from from I would say almost from hairdressers wanting to start up needing a loan to do that all the way to high tech to businesses that needs to be supported with loans and so on. They had some venture capital groups uh, back at the turn of the century um, in life sciences and technology. Um, they were beginning to see that having venture capital can be quite noisy as a governmental organization, right? Basically, you need Venture, venture capital is also about making choices of what to support and not to support mm. after you've given them the first investment. If you're a governmental organization and, and sort of everybody feels they have an ownership in that and that you need to support everything, you end up in something potentially quite noisy because you need to make these type of decisions. Mm. And as as we were going through a uh, financial difficult period, period in the early part of the century, they realized that this is... Maybe this is the, not the best way to do it. Maybe we should be at arm's length to it and have others do these difficult decisions. Uh, and then we support venture capital rather than doing too much of direct mm-hmm. investments. And let's have others take the heat. You could say so, right? <laughs> so, uh, so Sunstone was spun out of Vext Funden back in 2007 and was spun out to some extent with the investment strategy that had been supported in Vext Fund, which was life sciences. I mean, a patent, some good people, some grand ideas, let's go. Uh, but then as time evolved and we started learning more about what seemed to work and most certainly also what seemed not to work, 
uh, the strategy became much narrower, much more focused. So even though we, we retain the name, we today actually only invest in early stage drug development. Uh, but we've... We've, we hang, hang on to the history and, and this name and from, from where we came, right? But today, Sunstone Life Science Ventures is a group that has specialized itself in investing in early stage drug development. It was founded, it was spun out by uh, myself and uh, two other partners, uh, Peter Benson, Benson who's a, um, a uh, Swedish executive, is retired now, he's retired in 2018, and then I took over as managing partner. Uh, and and also then over that period, Klaus Anderson stepped in as a partner. And then actually, as we are now transitioning again to a new fund, uh, my colleague and the third founding partner, Stein Berland, is beginning to retire out of uh, out of Sunstone, and we are putting together the pieces of a of a complementing the partner group, if you like, um, with new partners. Okay. Yeah, I was going to ask you uh, what what Sunstone's sweet spot is. You said yeah. early drug development, early yeah. stage drug development. Yeah. But the, uh, can you tell us something more about you know uh, specifics uh, regarding uh, ticket size, preferred yeah. ticket yeah. size, for yeah. example? Yeah, yeah. So, so the preferred ticket size is uh, anything between three and up to ten million euro over the lifetime of the of the investment. This sort of goes a little hand in hand with the fact that the funds so we've 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 been managing five funds up and, until now. Uh, we've been managing five hundred and fifty million euro. Divide that up all, you can see this as approximately hundred million euro per fund, right? Mm. Um, and per fund, you want to have a reasonable spread of risk uh, as part of the nature of our industry is that some things fail while some have success, right? And we think that is on the other side of having to do minus 10 investments, probably up towards the 15, uh, that would allow you enough successes to get the returns you're looking for on a fund. Uh, and if you then look at the fund size, or you end up, I mean, these things all work out. Uh, so it's about 10 million euro uh, to get to that number of investments. It's also, if you're an early stage investor, that type of investment allows you anything between, then let's say, 5 to 25% of a company, uh, depending on when you invest, mm. uh, which is sort of the owner share that gets you access to get on the board, which we prefer to be. Mm. You're um, an active investor in that we are, sense. We are most certainly an active investor. We've, uh, we would very much like to see that the portfolio company, we have to not repeat some of the mistakes that, that we've made historically uh, and try and, and help out. And, and you, I mean, to help out in a qualified way, you need to understand what's going on. And to understand what's going on, you need to be close to the company. Mm. So. And, and in terms of uh, investment uh, hor horizon, and yeah. how, how, how long are the funds uh, active for? So a typical <coughs> venture fund, right, these days is a, you basically say it's a five plus five plus one plus one plus one. Um, and implying that you've got five years to put the portfolio together, you've got five years to exit the portfolio, and everybody realizes that there's going to be something you did not quite exit as you basically have an agreement with the investors that you can add a year and a year and a year. Um, so, so those are, I mean, the, those are the, the framework that you simply have to do your investment under, uh, sort of a convention that, that's in the industry that, that's that's how it's set up. Mm. Interestingly, uh, if you look at the data, uh, and here you can take um, you take Adam Street data. So Adam Street is a fund of fund investors. So they invest in funds like us. We do not have them in investors, but but they've been active in this since I think the late seventies, and they are they are super super good at it. I mean they they uh, if you have it's almost a qualifier in itself if you have Adam Street as an investor in your fund. Uh, they show that the average successful fund takes about 15, 16 years or something like that. So it's a strange situation, right? They're the best. Uh, How come they're not in your fund then? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Not yet. They, they are not in our fund because 
they have a quality that allows them to do two finger, what I would call two finger due diligence. Oh, what's that? That's basically you take one finger in the your sort of history performance, and you take one finger in the performance of the fund you are considering investing. You sort of go result by result. You don't really need to be too concerned with the team. Or they 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 will they can just take the best of the best that's out there, just looking at the numbers, right? Mm. And I think in general in in Scandinavian venture capital, I mean, we're I think I think we've learned a lot. We've done really well, uh, but but relative to a much more mature U.S. venture capital um, ecosystem, we still we still need to get to a different place. Mm. This is, I mean, venture capital across the various industries needs to deliver above 3x consistently. Otherwise, why would you go to us? Why wouldn't you go to private equity, small, medium-sized buyout that has probably been delivering something like that for a period, right? So that is what we need to do. Mm. Three, three, three times the money back. Uh, consistently. What is your track record up until now? It is not, we don't have any fund that has delivered uh, three times the return yet. I think our fund four, the current fund, is going to be the first fund that does it. Mm -hmm. We have, it's also the first fund we've done that I think collects all the lessons learned, not just from us. I we, so in the mid, mid 10 sort of, so as I said, we started in 2007, right? And and life sciences in the broad scope, uh, quite focused on the Nordics. Mm -hmm. uh, we were allowed to do a little in Europe, but but had sort of come out of a very Danish setup and then was allowed to take a sort of Scandinavian and allowed to say, I mean, that's maybe not fair. We also thought that would be enough. Mm. Is it still, uh, you still have a, uh, no. that geographical focus? No, no, you can't do that. No. I mean, that is, that is a, uh, that's not doable. I mean, and that goes a little back to sort of where I was getting how the strategy for Fund 4 came about. Because as you got into maybe 13, 14, 15, we were beginning to basically see, I mean, here's some successes, some really good exits, and most certainly also some really expensive losses. And and out of that, we're beginning to see the, a, a, a let's say, then an update strategy forming, but, uh, but also a realization that, that, you know, still it was like, let's say 12, 13 observations in terms of losses and wins, right? And it's actually, let's sort of be very open, it's not a lot of data points in a strategy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, there is a tendency for, for our industry to basically make strategy based on some big success stories, right? You would go out and say, well, look at the amount of money beyond tech made, right? I mean, this was of this big, big thing, but then on the other hand, super atypical. I mean, it's like you can't have a strategy that depends on having a pandemic, right? So, so we, we, we were looking at that. We say, listen, why don't we just step a bit back from this, right? That we are actually, what are we? We're basically a business of developing and selling companies. What does that, if you step back from it, what does that industry look like of finding, developing and selling business? What is the market? for selling these companies. Mm. So we took a look at, at European M&A transactions the past 15, 20 years, where they're very open by basically saying, well, does it make, could you cherry pick your to 3X? And if you, because if you can't, mm. then maybe we should go and do something else. So the first piece of good news was that, that and we found, I think there might be, going 15 years back, 120 transactions, M&A transactions, uh, that VC developed uh, and made money from in Europe. And the first piece of good news was they're super attractive. Like they have an average multiple of about 10. Mm. Uh, the, the, the other observation though was that's not a lot, right? Mm. It's, it's about 120 transactions, so again, focusing on Europe, that needs to, that, that, that that's, let's say 40, I don't know, 30, 40 brand name VCs in Europe are aspiring to make their returns from. So we thought, wow, we need, we need to take a thorough look at those transactions and learn whatever, where did they come from? What do they look like? Because if, if that's the market that we're in, we, we basically need to capture it all. We can't, we can't take a sub-segment of that. It's, it's all of it, right? And and some of it matched well with what we've we had learned ourselves, right? In in um, in our own investments, 
Uh, but there were also a couple of, uh, of surprises in there. One of them was that, uh, that the really good returns were before you have invested 50 million euros mm. into the company. Uh, we, had, we had seen a little of that, that it seems to be, well, if, I mean, it was either you got the traction and you were going, you make good return, or it seemed like you kept on going endlessly. You could maybe still exit it, but you never got the sort of the 10x mm. that you want to have in our, in our industry, right? And you can discuss why that is. But basically, if you look at it, if you do the dot plot of, of those transactions, you will look and you look at that, you look at those sort of, let's say, from 5 to 50 million euro deployed into the company, you'll go, wow. Basically, if that's true, we should just we should need to be super careful up and until and understand what are the milestones we're generating, uh, why are they relevant for an M&A and so on. So, mm. so, so that was a, a bit of an eye-opener for us and has made us more concerned with big financing rounds and companies that already received substantial amount of funding. Mm. Yeah. I heard about the, this this uh, enterprise that started out just the other day, uh, having one billion dollars as a starting yeah. capital. Yeah, it, it's it, we we were so what we did following that right because we were a bit surprised by it. we said okay, is this a European phenomenon? This is just because this is Europe, uh, and then we did the same analysis, not to the same depth on the US market and said, uh, what happens here? But basically it's the same thing. They they managed to push it up to a hundred million and, and they have more that have received a lot of capital and get a high multiple. But you saw, let's get them more, the same the same picture. Mm. What we then did, uh, which also footprinted in our strategy, we looked at going back to, okay, we need to make sure that we cater to the majority of those transactions through our investment strategy. And and we looked at and because we knew all the companies, we could go into them and say what were they about and where were they, how developed were they, what clinical states were they at, mm. and the next, of course, it was sort of indicated by the fact that that they had high multiple without a lot deployed. We were sort of does it also translate to early right? Because I mean, I mean, you know, our industry will usually say, well, we get it to phase two, mm. <clears throat> and that's where the real value is, right? When you show you've got efficacy in humans. Mm. And, and that is true. Uh, the majority of those transactions are out of phase two. But the interesting observation was that as many, if not more, of the transactions are before phase two. Mm. And of those, most of them are preclinical. All right. All right. Mm. The even bigger surprise was that the multiple in a preclinical opportunity is much, much better mm. than it is in phase two. How come? That's a super good question. Mm. And, and this is, I mean, we, we also debate this with our colleague. So, so we, we think we know why, but, uh, but it is speculative, right? What we mm. basically think is that once you have a phase, two, if you're doing a phase two trial, right, uh, to be allowed to do a phase two trial, you need to sort of say, well, this is the patient population we're targeting, right? You need to say, this is the effect size we're targeting. If you have the effect size and you've got the patient population, then you also have an idea about the pricing. Mm. So now we have the pricing, we've got the patient population. Now you can start to calculate a market value. And you can basically do a risk adjusted net present value relative to where you are today, right? So if you're trying to sell a phase two project or company, then you are actually selling a risk adjusted net present value of a business proposition. You're, you're selling a calculation. You're selling, you're selling a calculation on a business. And there's simply a limit to the multiple a buyer is going to allow you on that. If, if, if you calculate that the business is 100 million, uh, then, then there's just a limit to the business. Mm. If you're selling a preclinical opportunity, if, if we're selling a piece of incredibly exciting biology, right? You're selling a vision. You're selling a multiple of a dream, mm. right? So this is the difference between selling a multiple of a dream and a multiple of a business. And, and we, we think, and, and then, of course, so, so you're, you're, I, we think with, the, with the, that number of transactions, your investment strategy needs to cater to that. You need to, you need to try and understand what is it, what is it in these preclinical opportunities that certainly creates traction with the industry. Um, and of course, that's difficult to make tangible, but it is something about the, the, the innovation that's encapsulated with that opportunity. Disruption. 
It is. It is. This is about these buzzwords like disrupt, disruption, mm-hmm. uh, uh, having changing the industry. If this really is true, mm. it, it is those type of innovations. Sometimes we 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 get off easier with talking about what we don't think it is. Right? It's not. It's not reducing cost of goods. It's mm. not add-on treatments. No. It's not repositioning. It's not. It's not a me too drug. It is not definitely not a me too drug. Mm. All of those things are still potentially very valuable businesses, but nobody would buy them early. Because we also think another realization of being an early stage investor and trying to cater to these opportunities is realizing that if that is what we're selling, then we're selling to the head of r and mm-hmm. And if we're selling to the head of r and it better be interesting. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it, he or she wants something that's super exciting into their, into their departments. Mm-hmm. It's actually... I mean, after we saw this and started discussing it, I mean, we made another uh, interesting observations, if you like, was that, so we've we've done a fair number of transactions, but we've certainly also been in negotiations to do a fair number of transactions and been very, very close, but basically no cigar, if you like. But uh, that's going to be super interesting to talk more about, the, yeah. the sort of what made you back out of those. or, or We didn't back out. We no, didn't no. back out. Okay. I, the, the, what I was about to say is the biggest risk we've seen, when it didn't happen, mm-hmm. it was, for most of the times, it has been that the head of R&D in the organizations was laid off. Oh. And that's, you know, you would think that the Rosses, Fices, GSKs of the world, right, that, that the, the strategy that they that they acquire by transpires beyond the head of Andy. Beyond one person, yeah. Exactly. Mm. But but and when we talk to business developers, they they are like they're really nodding, right? They're saying, yeah, it is still in these big organizations, the what goes into the R department so much hangs on who's the head of Andy, what are they, what are their passions and what do we mm. want to buy? I'm curious, though, uh, when you did this uh, analysis yeah. of backtracking uh, yeah. transactions yeah. And, yeah. and do the dot plot, as you said, it, yeah. um, could you correlate um, the interesting transactions with yeah. the bigger multiples? Did, could you correlate that with any specific trends into, uh, you know, certain indications yeah. or areas? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you can, but, but they're not that surprising and, and has also been done by us, right, that I think, as others have observed, and we we verify, uh, that's also what we see. About forty percent, maybe up to fifty percent of all venture capital returns comes out of oncology, mm. um, then followed by neurology, immunology, probably as as bigger themes. Mm. And lately, perhaps obesity and let maybe obesity. It, it, well, if you look at what we're doing, I mean, it could be coming, could mm. be coming, right? That's definitely a field of interest right now. Mm. Uh, that's for sure. Hmm. You mentioned uh, early on here, um, you know, you said um, a good team, great idea, grand mm-hmm. plans, let's mm-hmm. go. Mm-hmm. What would you say is more more important? How, could, could you have a, 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 an inexperienced team with a great idea? Yeah. Uh, would that beat a great team with a pretty good idea? Yeah. Any day. So the great I mean, idea is better. Yeah. So 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 and I think that's that's probably also what makes our industry stick a little out. That this fundamentally this starts with the innovation. Uh and and a an incredible innovation with a bad I mean a bad team can ruin a incredible innovation, but a good team can never fix it. Mm. I mean that 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 core innovation needs to be to be there, and then we can build from there. And and you can fix I mean, it might might sound a bit uh, brutal, but you can fix a bad team. Mm. You can't fix a, a bad innovation. So it's like in real estate, you have location, location, location. Yeah, Here you point. have innovation, innovation, yeah, innovation. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. I, I, and I'm not a good team is is really important, uh, and 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 acting on a team that's not good is really important. Mm. Um, I would though say we would not. We were not. We don't greenfield projects in the sense that 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 here's an interesting innovation and there's no people around it. There needs to be a nucleus of trustworthy, good people to start from to build on. Um, That feels ownership Mm. to the innovation uh, from the offset. Mm. In our view, everybody that doesn't need to be there, but there needs to be this nucleus of a good person mm. from whom we can start. 
Y yeah, nothing, nothing good gets built without some people who, who are sort of passionate absolutely. about it. No, absolutely. Uh, what are you passionate about? In oh, many things. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I am passionate about entrepreneurs. I mean these. Uh, these talents that you meet uh, that 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 both have an incredible insight and knowledge and and a unique and I think it comes with that the I mean and an understanding and how to communicate it or how yeah how to communicate how to translate it right some of the things we look at are so complex uh, that that this company and and because of that complexity you can't really communicate it well if you don't understand it if you don't if you don't have that knowledge yourself then you can't communicate it with uh, credibility um and and then at the same time you have to have this skill of communication that allows you to to draw this bridge from this innovations relevance for this pathology relevance for this disease for these patients you need to bring the the whom you're communicating with and trying to share this excitement with on this path you you're sitting here with this i mean this interesting observation in this part of the brain in these pathways that maybe just a few people in the world really understand right and then make it relevant for this disease progression for this disease and so on and some entrepreneurs really can do that and that that makes me super excited mm. uh, have you have you experienced the the meeting one of these exceptional entrepreneurs uh, and clearly very passionate and you thought too bad they didn't have a better idea with them yeah that's super yeah yeah i have they're, they're really good communicators mm. out there where where that doesn't i mean would, would you give them that feedback and say that yeah maybe I you think, should be in another field mm. I don't know if we'll tell them go do something else. Your talent, go do something else. I think we're trying to be transparent and open about uh, what we think about them, particularly the ones we meet with. Uh, trying to give them a a qualified feedback. Um, I think mostly we will focus on the the innovation as such. Um, I don't think we give. Was the risk of having done it at some time? I think we we uh, we're probably not being very direct when it comes to sort of what we think of the people involved. Even yeah. though you're Danish, even though we're Danish, even though we're Danish, even though we're yeah. Danish. I, I I read uh, actually just yesterday. I read a post on LinkedIn. There are yeah. lots of posts on yeah. LinkedIn on many subjects, and yes. one subject that comes up fairly often in my yeah. flow so to yeah. speak that's vcs yeah. and and there was a quote from a guy said it, saying that all good vcs are assholes and i'm not saying yeah. that's not my opinion but uh that was the notion of it yeah. and of course there was a debate on whether that was true or not yeah. and surprisingly many of the commentators they they were agreeing would yeah. you agree to that no i would i would not agree to that uh, I think it is a, I understand where it's coming from, because part of our industry is having to take hard decisions. But, but I, I think you can still do that respectfully, that you, that you have to say no. And you can't even, and I would even say, you have, you have to say no sometimes, you have to make choices, because, and you have to make choices, even in things that are potentially, could be successful, right? You You don't, we we put together a portfolio uh, of opportunities, and and some of them failed by themselves. But sometimes we also we have a limited liquidity, right? That that uh, sometimes they don't all fail, right? And you simply need to make priorities, and that of course can create a bit of noise. You still need to do that respectfully, and you can do it respectfully, even if you do it respectfully. There are still people that you can't communicate with, and that basically you you basically don't have a rapport with and and you can't can't get beyond that right so i can see where it come from but i don't i don't agree with it that uh well let me put it in a different way i know a lot of really bad vcs that i believe are assholes 
<laughs> Funny because one of your peers said the exact same thing in well, not he didn't say many, but he said there are. <laughs> yeah, no, I fully agree. I, but in all fairness, the the discussion I read about that, that there there was also uh, a nuance to it, uh, saying that the, the because to need to be a good uh, to to be a really good VC, you need to be somewhat isolationist in 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 terms of well, I guess then super focused on. Yeah, what is it? you said it's yourself. Sometimes you need to say no to things. Yeah. Uh, it could be a good idea, but you still need to say no for yeah. some reason, and yeah. and that of course can step on some toes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, sure. I, I think that's that's exactly true. Mm. So, uh, venture capital insight. Uh, you told us about how 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 sounds the the, the yeah. background to sounds, <clears throat> but for you personally, yeah. how did you get into this business? Ouch! From yeah. the from the get go, so to speak. When did you when did you realize that this is something I'm good at, for example? When did I realize that venture capital was something that I was good at? Mm. Uh, it, it, it is probably when we started looking at this in top down as 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 we go back. It was it was when we were beginning. So when we were beginning to triangulate about what what we could bring, what we had been doing, and what the market looked like in general, I think we had some sort of a yurky moments. Sort of this, okay, this is how it works. Mm. Um, that that I think sets us a little apart. I hope. I think mm. by now, right? Um, and and I think we we became. As also as a team, right? Uh, all of us beginning to 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 put these pieces together, that made us good, mm. uh, and which is why I'm I'm very optimistic about the the fund that we're in right now, where we're taking these elements, putting them together, and sort of manifesting them in in how we invest and how we work with the portfolio. Mm. And uh, if, on on a personal level, then yeah. what's your what's your exact background? Do you, uh, were you really good at? chemistry or uh, you, do, no, you don't have to give me the full story background no, 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 that would be the, too long yeah. i think i think on a personal level i went from i went from sort of with being an entrepreneur which is partly probably also why i like what i do today right being an entrepreneur right from when i was doing my masters uh i did a i made a patent i actually came to study here in lund because was it in medicine or was it in, it was in uh, it was in actually in diagnostics mm-hmm. um and and there was some technology here in Lund, uh, at uh, Lund University that that I wanted to access. Uh, made a deal with a professor here mm. that I could borrow a lab and then try and work on my patent. Patented it, went out in the world, tried to sell it. Then I started working in the industry. You said try to sell it. Yeah, you know I've had a couple of times where I thought I would be very wealthy. Uh, <laughs> this was one of them. Uh, didn't happen. No, no, it was um, that. That I'll spare you the long story. It's an interesting story, though, yeah, but, yeah. but it's a long story. Mm. Uh, then I started working in in Andy. I mean, as an Andy scientist, if you like, uh, an instrumentation company. Then became head of innovation. Then became. But it, and then I became head of R&D. But in that transition, I became more and more interested in in managing super skilled people, uh, and 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 how different it is from managing from a point of expertise. Right? I certainly I had a team of of ele- electronic engineers, of people that knew programming, mechanical engineers, all a lot of people that knew a lot of stuff I had no clue about. Right, and we needed to develop something together. How the heck do you do that? I mean, you, you sim- they've got no chance in hell on telling them how to do their job. Right? How do they? How do you go from a situation where people say, "Not my problem." It's not. I mean, the electronics work just perfectly. That's not where the issue is. Right? Mm-hmm. How do you create this sense of direction and this motivation to get to a common objective when you have no clue what they're talking about? I became super interested in that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I was on that route when I met Peter Benson actually, mm. and I was sort of preaching my passion about how you manage R and D people. And Peter said, you know, so that's super fine. Have you thought about coming to this side of the table and then help these companies mm. with that? And that's how I I had never thought about that, uh, but that sounded super interesting. And then like that, I was in venture capital. Mm. 
And 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 then being on that side of the table um, with the well the financial uh, resources to help companies. Yep. I mean, uh, I'm I'm pretty sure you 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 have a well deal inf- incoming deal flow or yep. at least leads flow yep. Yep. Uh, that you get to see and review lots yep. and lots of projects yep. uh, and uh, yep. well interesting potential in some of them. How do you how do you screen or how do you choose pick and choose <laughs> what what kind of basic criteria do you use yeah. if if it's possible to narrow it down to a few basic criteria i mean it it, it is of course something of course it starts off with with drug development yeah. uh, uh in, in the broadest broadest sense right um so we at sunstone we actually recently because we've just We've just done the last investment in our latest fund, uh, and uh, that allowed us to sort of sit back and look, okay, what did it actually take uh, to get to these, I think, 12 investments, right, of which we've sold two, so nine, I think it's nine left right now. And um, we looked at a little more than, we were approached by 3,000, 3,000 companies came to us in that period. Mm. We about... Uh, I think 1,200, 13, something like that, around 1,000 was within our strategy. And then going to a question, so the strategy would be basically drug development and and stage. Uh, so it's a drug development. It's in, within the stage that we would uh, uh, look at. Which is that to be, to that be would specific? Be from pre- we, will, we will say from... from well, this is how you slice and dice it, right? We would say mm. preclinical typically needs to have differentiated results in an in vivo model, so in, in, in animals, right? Mm. Uh, but that said, we get a little concerned if it's more than two years from first in man. Mm. Uh, so that, and that makes us like a typical seed slash series A investor. So maybe what we would do is, I don't know, 15, 20% seed investments and then series A, which is, can be a lot of different things these days. Mm-hmm. And um, so drug development, early stage by that framing. Um, Europe, we only invest in Europe. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, a, a financing round where we think we can have a meaningful share of it, right? So it could be early stage, it could be, but if we're talking 150 million Series A, it's probably not for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we want to take. We think that that even though we need to aspire to sell early, then yes, the majority actually still does get done in phase two. So we need to have financial frame or plan that brings us to that. Mm. Um, and that that's part of of also what we look for. Is that is that also what they're looking for, right? Um, when they say they, that's... when they approach us, right? You yeah, come yeah, to yeah. us with an yeah. investment proposal. Mm-hmm. We're saying, no, I just want two million euro from one investor to get me to here. Mm-hmm. Um, if we can't, if we can't see that we potentially convince you, that's not the way to do it. We, we, you may start with two, but we need to have investors in place and the financial stamina to go all the way mm-hmm. uh, to a phase two. So that's also part of it. If all of that is, so that's about these 1,000, right? Then then the next part is, this actually looks interesting. We need to learn a bit more. Then the next thing is always meeting the team. So we've, for that fund, we met five, more than 500 companies. Mm. Um, if it's possible to put a percentage uh, on or proportion of the number of times you decided to walk away from something, depending on the team. <sighs> It's, it's, it's very few. I mean, this goes really back to if it's really interesting, I wouldn't say that there's not any, but that it's, it's less than 5%, if not uh-huh. even less. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's much more frequently uh, once we start getting into the innovation, the plans, mm-hmm. financing, the syndications, mm-hmm. and so on. There, there is, always, <coughs> well, I think uh, you always hear, or you often hear, there is a huge emphasis on the team. So, yep. does that mean that we have really good teams in Europe? I th- I want you to be careful with one of those. Yeah, that right, could be sensitive, right, right. I guess. No, I will not sensitive, but but I think, 
I think there's also this difference between talking team and then talking individuals here, right? Founders, that, that, uh, yeah, founders, founders exactly. Yeah. I, I think, I think we we definitely have good individuals. I mean, this nucleus from which to then build that team uh, that we require to be there is most frequently there. Um, it's yeah. I think we have good people in Europe. I fully realize that the talent pool in, in the U.S. is is incredible, right? Because mm -hmm. you've got a lot of repeat entrepreneurs. You've got a big industry there that, and you've got big financing industries and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's different scale. It's like three to three to one or something like that. Mm -hmm. And and then even that said, it's concentrated right on the East Coast and the West Coast, making the density even higher. Mm -hmm. Perhaps also uh, the fact that if you have a, a an experienced team in the U.S seem to be able to take an asset, put together a team, take an asset and instantly get quite good funding uh, yeah. based on the their previous yeah. track record. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah. I so back to it's not many cases. It, they, they, I'm definitely they are there where we basically this is an incredible innovation, but it's a horrible team. <laughs> <laughs> so. But you said you can fix teams. You can fix teams. Yeah. You can't you can't you can't basically at least we can't uh you know wipe everything out no. uh, that's not how it works no. um but you can improve teams mm. you can absolutely improve teams yeah do you often uh, find yourself in a situation where you have something that you consider to be very interesting and you have uh, um well you have perhaps then a founder or or a researcher or a scientist yeah. who is currently appointed ceo of yeah. the new company yeah. and you just uh, need to tell they them that yep. sorry but you are not right for this role yes we need to have yes. someone more commercially yes yes is that a tough uh, day no, at work i don't think it's a tough day at work and the reason it is i mean so firstly i should say we've if you go back historically uh we we were probably not as outspoken about we were thinking it but we were not talking about it and then maybe later acting on it creating a lot of noise these days this is the discussion we'll have before we invest so, uh, so of course you will have academic entrepreneurs uh, when you're investing as early as we are. But we'll sit down with them before we invest, before we get very far into and say, listen, I mean, you've driven this far, you're definitely a talent. You could make it all, because nobody knows. You could take it all the way. Could evolve. You could evolve. You'll need to grow, but you can certainly do that. So we are not saying no way. But it's important for us that we've had this discussion that I'm telling you here up front that you may not. And that's also that that's all, not the same thing as saying there won't be a role for you, but at some time we may need a, a different CNO relative to you. And I have to say, I haven't, I myself have done that your times twice now, and it's not an issue. I mean, I mean, you can, there's a emotions in it, but, but, uh, that's also what's making them good entrepreneurs that they understand that these type of things right mm. yeah so so investing in someone's life's work then or their their you know their own baby that they might have it's, been working at, at for decades uh, that's absolutely uh, maybe not decades but that, yeah. there's emotions in it that yeah. is for sure and mm. there's more than more than their sort of there's emotions in it mm. that's for sure mm. do you consider sunstone life science ventures your life's work yeah, I do. I mean, this is by far where I've been the most. I've, I, I'm, I mean, I look at the, so I go to these presentations and I, I look at the, and I've had the opportunity to see Adam Street present a couple of times. And I want to, I mean, we're going in there. I'm, so when you look at their venture capital, so what they show they've done, so this is venture capital, so it includes both life sciences and, um, and technology and whatever could be in there, right? Hmm. They are showing, on, they have about, I think it's about th almost 3,000 exits compiled in venture capital. The, the overall uh, uh, multiple on that is 4x over since 78 mm -hmm. until to today, right? Of course, there's still some costs they don't include, but mm -hmm. still that 4x should allow you for a bit of cost, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the loss ratio is 30%, right? So they're saying, you know, you need to kick out 30% mm. uh, as you go along because they only talk about the realization. So only portfolio companies that are overdone and gone. Mm. Forget all the rest, that's all they look at. Mm. Uh, that's where we need to go. We need to show 
if they have that on on average, it means others are doing better, and of course, some are doing a bit worse. Mm. So you can even do much better than that. That's where we need to go. Mm. Uh, that's that's my pain. I I want, and I and my I speak for my partners as well. That's what we feel. Pain. We want to show that we can do something like this. Mm. Uh, with an offset here in the Nordics. Mm. Speaking of them, uh, you, you're, you're saying that's where we need to go. Speaking mm. of where to go, mm. uh, another thing said sometimes about VCs is that there are a flock of sheep, basically, who run yep. to the towards the same, the, the new hot area, so to speak. Yep. Do, you, do you consider Sunstone to be more contrarian, or is it truth there even for you? So... I think the important thing is to say to some extent that the industry, I mean, the pharmaceutical industry, is a flock of sheep, mm. right? That certainly discovers that no one makes a breakthrough in obesity. And then you hear the bear in <laughs> yeah. the background. Yeah, I There's, remember just a few years back, I think no one is interested in obesity. Absolutely not. No. Absolutely not, right? Uh, and if you go further back, right, some make a a breakthrough as a with an with an oncology and immunology and everybody sort of running that way. So and of course we need to respond to there's absolutely an an opportunity tailing that um trend, trend or new direction mm. for venture capital because certainly they're all looking for that. Mm. And they're not looking for it because we are getting activated. They're looking at it from a tactical point of view they want to get involved right and your investors might have seen this um, and as well right as well but but so so we need we need to to we need to to be sensitive to that and and yes we start when that happens we start looking in for for obesity opportunities or diabetes opportunities or things like that right um and try and spike that in but we need to be we need to be sensitive to also trends going down uh, and and we have been getting more concerned with oncology. We still need super interest in it. Still think that's a, I mean, is a big opportunity there. But also it's getting much more difficult. Um, mm. Why is that? Do you think it is because it is becoming very combinatorial that that uh, you put several treatments, you put them on top of each other. Uh, there are now a lot of treatments, right? So, so there's first line, fourth, third, second line, third mm-hmm. line, fourth line, and so on. And you sort of get into that uh, ranking of mm-hmm. of treatments. Um, hard to overlook. <clears throat> it's hard to overlook. It's hard to find because the way we operate operate is really to keep it capital efficient, right? We want we wanna we wanna do a clinical trial that is the best possible. So manifestation of what this innovation could do for patients. Um, and But obviously, as as it becomes a more complex map, finding that little white spot on the map mm-hmm. um, where there's both a, here's a good illustration or manifestation, or, or mm-hmm. a, you know, here we can show what it can do, mm-hmm. and you could extrapolate out from here. If there are all types of interdependencies involved in that area, it becomes harder mm-hmm. To, to have that argument. And that is, that's the situation with oncology right now. Mm. Would you say that there, in, in your opinion, do you see any of other uh, areas and where you, you think you can spot this white? Uh, or, and would you, ta- <laughs> would you tell me? If no, was? Yeah, yeah, I would most certainly. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, as we talked about a little earlier, we, we think that this is to some extent a numbers game. We need to expose ourselves to opportunities. I mean, mm. we need to make entrepreneurs want to come to us. We simply can't. There's no way of going out and mining these opportunities. So, and the only way to do that is to talk about what we're looking for, what we think is interesting and exciting, right? So we've been looking, if you look at our latest portfolio, it does have a, a higher than before footprint of neurology. For the first time, we've done two investments in neuropsychiatry, um, which is a uh, super interesting Sort of bet for us, if you like. Is 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 Alzheimer's done? There? Is that also a, an that, important part of that? Or? that that's neurology, right? Yeah. Uh, it it could be. So, I mean, with at the stage we invest, sort of we, the the piece of biology, if you like, or the innovation will typically be be so that would then be neuroinflammation, uh, and whether that then ends, and then we we start to look where does it go best, right? Mm. Uh, and. That could be Alzheimer's, mm. for instance, um, but that's then still to be seen for those opportunities. 
uh, the no psychiatry is more about like Tourette syndrome, PTSD, schizophrenia, mm-hmm. these type of opportunities that historically have been and probably still are super hard mm-hmm. on one side, but so was obesity. Mm-hmm. Uh, but on the other hand, also a beginning to have a, I mean, look at how much attention, I like an issue this is becoming in our society with with psychiatric disorders, right? Mm. Um, it's a huge sort of white space, we think, still. Mm. On, and younger, on younger, younger, younger. Exactly. Younger. I mean, I read this, we were looking at the mortality and, uh, and what people were dying from and in terms of diseases and other things. And this is really, I mean, we have, we've managed to reduce mortality in almost everything. The only thing where it still is increasing is in suicide mm. of young men and women. Yeah. It's, it's almost impossible to grasp, right, that we're, we've made all these improvements mm. and, and increased wealth, and then still more and more young people are killing themselves. Yeah. It's horrible. There are a number of directions this discussion could take <laughs> where that would be, uh, but that would, that would take us very far from, yeah. from, yeah, the, yeah, from yeah, the yeah. core, I guess. So no, this. but that's just to say, yeah. so no, back to your wise space. We mm. think no psychiatry could could be and become a very big thing. Mm. Uh, uh, standing there yesterday over my pizza, though, yeah. I thought I, I, it popped up in my head long, longevity, or or you know, is yeah. that is that an area you you think is interesting, or is it just uh, one of those pipe dreams? I don't think it's a hype dream. I don't know how much it caters to venture capital investments, right? Mm. Um, so, so because longevity is is for, for, to to treat that or to to enable that, right? It, it the, the drug or whatever you, tr- I mean, the treatment needs to be so safe. Mm. I guess the, we should probably say something about what longevity is. I mean, for for those who are not familiar with the term, then right. I, I, as a layman, I would interpret it as the you know <laughs> trying to reverse aging. Basically, I don't know if that's the correct way of seeing it, or is it just well, um, say either reducing the effects of aging? Yeah, reducing the effect of aging, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, or slow down the speed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because there probably is no way around it unless we before we can upload then yeah. we are probably a sort of an asymptotic mm. curve towards, I don't know, 130 or 140 years. Um, but, but, and, and, and so, th- so that is what it is about, right? Mm. Um, I think, I'm not sure the he- health economics of it works out to, to the advantage of, of venture capital mm-hmm. right now, right? What and, about humanity? You think it's for, for, it's for a benefit, or that's, that's a, a philo- that's philosophical? A, that's a big question. philosophical question, right? Uh, I honestly, I don't know. Um, on one side, you could say, if, big, big, depends a little on how we think it will be used, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, will it be used for us to be, and, and whether that longevity also translates into healthy lives? I mean, that's yeah, yeah. that's a big part of it, right? Mm. Do we just make it longer? Should we make it longer, mm. basically creating more diseases? Then uh, that's maybe not a no. good thing, right? Uh, or are we making it? Are we going for more healthy years? I mean, yeah, keep the age, but well, I guess that's uh, what happened uh, over the last decades. I mean. Isn't isn't sixty the new forty? To some extent, right. But mm. but we've definitely also created more diseases, mm. right? You live longer with cancer, but you need to treat it. Mm. You live longer with cardiovascular diseases, but you need obesity and diabetes. And look at obesity right now. Mm. So we probably may may by treating obesity, we may have extended lifetime. Actually, mm. you think uh, yeah, like the half of the world's population will be. Mm, uh, nibbling on on Vigovi, for example, <laughs> uh, in, in ten years, or or a similar thing. I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. But you could you could be you could be a bit concerned with that, right? Hmm. Maybe on the other hand, it is it's it's still an expensive, it's still an expensive treatment, hmm. and I don't you could question whether that'll be accessible for half the world's population. Yeah. 
But given the the attention that Field has now, and, and I guess also attention from investors and more companies than mm. getting into that field, then maybe maybe there will be other alternatives, uh, uh, better from pricing level uh, coming up. Yeah, we hope so. I mean, that that is our latest investment. Mm. That's exactly in this field. Can you can you say what what it is? Uh, what yeah, so the latest one is, is Rosales. It's a Italian company that came out of an innovation from from Denmark mm. that was with uh, Italian entrepreneurs. Uh, the 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 fame to claim, if you like, there is that they show reduction of weight uh, alone based on fat tissue so it's only the fat oh, so no muscle tissue. Tissue. exactly i yeah. mean no loss of lean mass mm-hmm. which is the big issue right mm. right now right is that you both lose um fat tissue but you also lose lean mass you also use uh, lose lean mass mm. uh and, and going back to our early discussions so these innovation this is this if this holds out this will change how obesity gets treated right mm. um and and this is what could make a head of R&D super excited <laughs> yeah. to have something like that. Sure. Uh, but that is, of course, I mean, that is like we talk. That is trying to 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 have a a play in this underlying trend right now that that's making everybody excited. Mm. It's trying to make sure that it is differentiated to what is there. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, I noticed you use the term "hole out." Do you play golf? No, no, <laughs> really? no, no. I'm a no, no. I don't play golf. No. Uh, using sports metaphors does not necessarily need uh, to mean that you are involved in the sport itself. So, <laughs> um, so do you remember your own first really, really good investment? How, what it was and how it played out. <coughs> Well, the, the 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 reason I'm I'm hesitating here is it it you can take a couple of approaches to this. I think I one of the investments that went through a lot of uh, interesting and educational and and had a lot of yes sort of moments was when was our investment in Evolution. That eventually, so it 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 incredibly incredible, super good team. Uh, we got to a super good team. Maybe there were some colorful people in between, but <laughs> but ended up with a fantastic team with Alex Guliav running it. It it was we had an a a listing here in, in Sweden, right, mm-hmm. which made it a Danish Swedish uh, investment. Also a fantastic journey. Uh, a really good collaboration on the board between the shareholders, uh, and then finally an M and A where Amgen uh, got simply too excited, or the head of an R and D got too <laughs> fell too much in love mm-hmm. with what the technology could do for Amgen, and then acquired uh, the whole thing. Remember, I think that was the f- first real big uh, deal, or big in in the sense of it, that was in in the billions of sec. I think yeah. six billion. <coughs> So probably that I saw since. So that was a that was a good story. I so it came out of uh, we decided, and originally it actually came out of Mm Vextfunden when we looked at what to to sort of what to put our bets into, and decide to convert a loan and take an active role in the company, and and that was a that was really good. Mm. Uh, I think. Uh, another thing, an investment that I have also really enjoyed, but which has gone uh, well, well, at least until now, is is not doing really well. Mm-hmm. But also was quite interesting was when we, and again, because a Swedish Danish thing, right, was Galecto Biotech, mm-hmm. uh, which was a uh, Swedish uh, academics combined with a Danish uh, entrepreneur, Hans Gambu, uh where Again, and here yeah, it was actually a head of R&D at BMS, got super excited by biology, made an option deal, incredible deal, learned a lot. And then they decided not to take the option. Mm. We then brought it to NASDAQ, um, which you can speculate whether that was wise or not. And then 
then unfortunately the trial failed and they were doing a IPF trial, so idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis trial, and they phase 2B trial. Uh, everything up and until then uh, had looked fantastic and then mm. it failed. I mean, very educational mm. as well. Um, and today the company is, is struggling, right, uh, after having failed and need to find out where they go from here. Mm. But I was up and until the listed part of that star as well. Mm. Also a very interesting, educational, fascinating um, in many ways. Mm. You mentioned listing on Nasdaq, uh, whether that was a wise thing or not. Uh, the IPO window has been firmly shut for mm. for some time. Mm. Um, at least in the US, it's starting to open up. Yeah. Uh, you can see <clears> that. <throat> and uh, how do you at Sunstone look uh, yeah. upon IPOs as yeah. an exit point or uh, an option for financing companies? So firstly, yeah, exactly. The latter. Uh, so, so we, uh, we do know, so let's, let's just do, so, so we've done about, we've done 27 transactions. I think it's either 13 or 14 of those that have been IPOs. A very good part of them has been profitable and some very profitable IPOs, uh, also here in Sweden. Uh, today we do not look at that as an exit. Um, and we prefer to not be part of the financing strategy. Um, when we are discussing this with with our companies, and the reason is it's is it takes simply takes too long, and it's simply it's too unpredictable. If you like, uh, we like some level of link between uh, clinical progression and the value in the portfolio and the value on the stock exchange market, mm. and that we've now seen is certainly not the case. But I think. It starts off with the with the time it takes. Even with the successes we've had, it's ten plus years. And we started out well, earlier. We talked about how a venture fund is five plus five plus one plus one, and and some of these companies have taken us up to fifteen years mm. uh, to get out of. And I would love to tell our investors they should be patient for fifteen years, but that just is not happening. Mm. Uh, that is uh, that won't happen. So we need to 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 try and avoid that. Um, in the work that we do about whether it's open. I mean, that doesn't change the fact, of course, that if we've got a vibrant, open uh, IPO market, that sort of pulls the whole market. And also you can, the buyers of our companies, the fact that they can issue shares and get money. I mean, so, so that uh, we, we are dependent on it in that way, that the, our industry is typically better when when that is is uh, on the rise and yes you're right we've had some ipos uh late last year also earlier this day they've been very much what we call dry ipos right so basically it's been the investors and the crossover investors that were already in the company that has been largely funding the ipo so mm. they got on the market mm. but at least they didn't collapse uh, no, exactly. on the market mm. so that's that is a good sign mm. Uh, What's your more, expectations then for the upcoming twelve to eighteen months? Do you think it's going to be yes. turning around? Yeah, yes, for the better. I think it'll, it'll become better, mm -hmm. um, and then that's it. It's become a very unpredictable world, right? So you get a war, and yeah. you get a pandemic, you get a war, and then everything you thought was going to happen doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. But I think it's it's going towards the better. I mean, we just saw was it today or yesterday that they. U.S. economy is doing incredibly well, um, and there's a lot of. I mean, that's an also interesting observation is that there's a lot of dry capital out there. I mean, there's a lot of money that, for period, was hesitant to deploy. And and needs to be deployed. It's a little. I think you shouldn't forget that, like venture capital, we when when we raise money, we need to deploy. I mean, mm -hmm. that's not. That's not an alternative that, that we say sort of, oh, no, well, it didn't really work out. Here, take your money back. No. That's not how it works, right? In that five year, you deploy. You can delay things a little, but ultimately, you need to, and preferably, you want to do it before those five years. And that, so, so that capital is out there that was raised two, three, four years ago, and it needs to deploy. Mm. Uh, and that, I think, also creates, sort of a self-enforcing thing here that, mm. that that needs to go out and work. Yeah. 
So hopefully we can expect a big wave of uh, investment. I think so. And I think that's another interesting analysis. If you, if you mm. look at the best venture capital um, years, right, they all they overlap perfectly with the bigger crisis, mm. right, because they ride the wave up. Mm. So it's when you're in a valley, those venture capital funds that was formed those years and start investing has consistently been the ones that does best. Mm. Well, they also get to invest to, at, a, at a lower valuation generally, right? They do. That's another interesting topic in itself is that, that uh, in, in life sciences, I would say that that valuations have over the 20 years I've been involved always been conservative mm. to say, mm -hmm. so to put it that way, right? That, that, um, you're putting some cards in the hands of your, your entrepreneurs that, yeah, <laughs> I know, but that is true, right? That, that to some extent, our industry for the past 15 years have been cost plus. Mm. How much has invested? Has it been invested wisely? And then you should have a premium on that, uh, which is different to top down, right? Basically saying this is the enormous value that this could have. Uh, and thus going back through risk, this must be the valuation. That does not happen in life science venture capital. I think all of we and all our colleagues will look at the inv capital invested um, and how that has been spent. That is, of course, a reflection of the scarce availability of venture capital in life sciences. Mm. Um, that there is that there is not much competition for good deals. Mm. Um, and uh, like you've seen, I mean, if you, our technology, our colleagues in technology is a very, very different scene. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say the uh, the competition for good deals, good entrepreneurs is much fiercer. Mm. And you sort of almost need to be out there when, when the opportunity happens to get hold of it. Because the value increments, I mean, there you, I mean, you can, you can be a seed only investor mm -hmm. and actually see a value recognition of the risk you took. Mm. You cannot do that in life sciences. Would be my, you cannot be a seed early stage investor in life sciences without having the capital or the reserve to hang on until you finally get some value recognition for the risk you've taken. Mm. What does that imply for, for I mean, the Swedish uh, stock market yeah. is very dynamic and yeah. lots of retail investors yeah. investing also in early biotech and so on. What does that employ uh, or, or imply, I should say, uh, for that type of investors and saying that you need to have capital to deploy? I mean, you, you, you can't put all your money in the first round. Basically, yeah. No, you're. That's a, that's a very good question, right? It, to to me, it implies firstly, of course, you need to be transparent about that and basically say say um, when you're communicating about the opportunity that you're listing, listing a something you're you're looking for financing to do your phase two. Uh, you need to be transparent about. Well, I mean, if we're doing phase two, that's not the end of the story. <laughs> it only gets more and more might expensive be, from here. Uh, for us, well, then <coughs> yeah, yeah, might not. Uh, yeah. uh, there's a, this is going to take more capital mm. eventually. Mm. Uh, and as an investor on the stock exchange, of course, you need to understand that that uh, that you need more capital. Mm. I think that could potentially be available there. I mean, as part of that journey, right, you could go first north, you could go small cap, you could go main capital. Mm. The the important thing there is that you deliver. I mean, oh, you, say, you say what you want to do and you do what you said you will yeah. be doing, right? Mm. Which is, of course, to some extent, sometimes out of your control when you're talking clinical trials. Mm. Um, I think that to the company, that becomes really important, right? That you can deliver mm. on what you've said you've done and you understand that if you don't, you're sort of almost in a binary situation. It becomes super hard mm. to to raise capital. Yeah, and 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 looking at like you said, listing on a small a smaller uh, marketplace, and um, historically over the years, we've seen quite a few IPOs. I mean, Sweden is renowned renowned for its many IPOs, yeah, uh, especially yeah. in this field. But um, we see quite <coughs> a few of them. 
where the the initial offering hasn't brought in that much capital. Yeah. I mean, it's a smaller one. You 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 could see companies listing and, and taking like 40, 50 million sec. Yeah. I think. And uh, and is that? I mean, in hindsight, is that just not a viable uh, strategy? Not if, it, if it doesn't give you if it doesn't give you the milestone you're looking for. I mean, you don't. I, I think it's not viable to raise money for half a phase two. No. Right. Uh, it needs to be an amount that brings you to a tangible value creating milestone. Otherwise, you shouldn't be doing. It. And I realize that's easier to say than not to do when mm. sort of presented with financing of your next 24 months of salary. Especially if it's the, the, the sort of the second alternative after having talked to you guys yeah, and you no, said, absolutely. sorry, you can't do yeah, it. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Mm. And I think, of course, as, as an investor, you need to be sensitive to that. Um, is this something, is this sort of the second second way out mm. after having failed in front of venture capital? Or is this a post-venture capital financing that could bring it to somewhere valuable mm -hmm. and i would say then that is typically something north of the 50 million sec right mm -hmm. um yeah yeah so um well vcs like exits um mm. investors like exits yeah. i guess uh do you have an exit plan for yourself personally uh, not a, a a tangible one in the sense that, and that day, not by not by event or by uh, date, if you like. Uh, what I do know, is, so I'm 59 now, right? Can't see it, but I am. No, I can't. <laughs> and uh, and we're raising our next fund, as I said. That's going to be five plus five. One, one, one. one, one and, yeah. yeah, yeah. And our investors, they, of course, they will look at the team and they'll go, okay, I mean, and they look at our age and say, that's 13 years. Does he or she look like they're going to hang around, stay alive, right? <laughs> and I think uh, they think that's quite credible now. Uh, I do think when we raise the next one in four or five years, that this is obviously something that will need to be addressed specifically. Uh, not necessarily a game by a date or event, but there we'll need to think about internally. Uh, so right now it's me uh, chairing our meetings and, and facing us in investor relations. And of course, we need to give a thought to four or five years from now, who's that's going to be. It's going to be anything like the TV series Succession. You no, think? I don't think I don't think so. And that's very much a tribute to our founding managing partner, Peter Benson, who had some after having been part of the hackles and shackles of uh, pharmacy for many years, had strong opinions about how to ensure uh, a strong team. Uh, a strong, I mean, good successions without uh, drama, without drama, mm. exactly. Uh, by by ensuring balanced ownerships, by ensuring that everybody sort of recognizes that the value of Sunstone Life Science Ventures is with the people that are at any time at Sunstone Life Science Ventures and not with the people that left Sunstone Life Science Ventures. Mm. He he saw that from the very first day and, and we we all buy into that. Uh, so I don't think that's going it's, to, it's, it wasn't a drama when Peter left. It's not a drama now when Steen is beginning to uh, retire. And I do certainly not expect it to be a drama when I start to phase out. And I, I hope like, so for Steen, uh, so Steen is 67 now. And sorry, Steen, if that was wrong, but I think he is. <laughs> um, and... And, we'll uh, invite him here to to reply. Yeah, you can do that. Case. You can do that. You should. He has a long career and done many things also apart from Sunstone. You should certainly do that. But what I wanted to say is we've agreed with Steen. He's becoming a venture partner now. We can still he'll still take part in our deal flow meetings when we discuss what's interesting and not. Uh, and at the same time, he gets more room to sail his boat and be with his family and his grandchildren and so on. I really think that's sort of it's an ideal way, right? That uh, that rather than having sort of a a uh, one day I'm doing this and then the other day I'm doing something entirely different. Mm. Uh, in particular, when it's something you love like doing, I and also if you really like the team, I mm. mean, it's hard not for it to become a bit of a family mm. uh, when you work together for these many years in a mm. in a small group. Uh, and uh, why would you? 
if we can find a way of of ensuring we get the best of both worlds, allow more time to do other stuff, but stay with one foot in the family, why should we try and achieve that? Mm. So you don't golf. Um, do you sail a boat? No, I'm a enthusiastic amateur mountain biker. Uh, okay. Which is, of course, a strange thing in the flat Denmark to call yourself a mountain biker. Well, there are a lot of cyclists in Denmark. There's a sure. lot of cyclists and there's... I think to a surprise to many also a lot of mountain bike trails mm-hmm. um, and around Copenhagen unusually a lot of forests uh, um, tribute to the ancient or old kings that decided they wanted for themselves uh, until it then became public mm. uh, you could you could invite our producer David he's an avid mountain biker he so he, he would probably man, love to man. come over yeah, and yeah, try the yeah. tracks absolutely in sure. Denmark yeah for sure uh so uh so it's been lovely to talk to you uh very interesting and uh, i probably have a thousand more questions <laughs> but i think that uh, they will have to wait to the sequel oh you uh, should be very welcome I'm it is friday and you need to get home to copenhagen to yeah. hit the 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 the, the, the cocktail parties <laughs> perhaps that's, good. that's actually a good point <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Thank you very much for no, taking the time. No, you're very welcome. Time. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Anytime. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.